Autodex and Dimitri is from the EPFL in uh, Switzerland. So I'll uh, uh, pass the ball to uh, Dimitri. Yes, so it's muted off audio on. So thank you everybody to to, to join this meeting today and uh, welcome to the new uh, uh, colleagues. And I think we have already uh, Barry Smith, who is prepared on the screen to, to give us an overview of BFO. So BFO is basic formal odology, one of the few formal odologies available in the market with a already strong and established experience and uh, in the uh, um, biomedical sector with the Obo Foundry. And this experience will be very helpful to, to us in the industrial engineering manufacturing field. And I would like not uh, to not talk more about that. So I would like to ask Barry Smith to to to, to go ahead. Barry, thank you, Demetrius. <clears throat> so um, originally we were going to be talking today about OntoStep, and then I was going to respond to to the presentation of OntoStep um, at a later stage. But uh, we've switched the order, uh, so I'm stepping in to fill a gap this week. I'm going to talk a little bit about OntoStep at the beginning uh, to set the scene. Um, and so the idea behind the IOF, as I understand it, is that we should have a hub and spokes approach. And uh, we will have a top level ontology at the beginning and then all the other ontologies within the IOF will descend from this top level ontology. And then some of those descending ontologies will have further ontologies which descend downwards from them. And um, so the quest first question which arises, assuming that we agree on the hub of spokes model, is what should serve as the hub? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to make a, a case for the thesis that BFO should serve as the hub. And uh, there are a number of examples of ontology suites which have this hub and spokes structure. Uh, uh, there are also suites of ontology, such as the suite called Suite, uh, which is the NASA ontology created by the top grade community. Uh, it's listed in the middle here. Uh, the Suite suite does not have a hub. Um, it's not organized on the hub and spokes model, but the, all the ones marked with a yes here do have a hub. And um, these ones, the orange ones on the left use BFO as their hub. And some of these suites are very large. So the Common Core Ontologies now is a very large suite of ontologies, which is being used by a number of very large uh, organizations. Uh, the Open Biomedical Ontologies at the very top is the, um, uh, the uh, inspiration, if you like, for the idea of the IO Foundry. This is a suite of ontologies which has been heavily used over uh, more than 12 years now to support interoperability across different branches of biology and medicine. And it's been very successful. And I think that the leaders in the OBO community will acknowledge that part of the reason for that success is because BFO has proved useful to, to uh, promote interoperability across many different ontologies. So these are uh, uh, criteria which I think we should bear in mind when we think about what should serve as the hub. The first criterion says that the hub should not have any domain content. The reason being that if the hub has domain content, then that will conflict with the control of the corresponding domain ontology by the domain experts. So the idea underlying the OBO foundry, which I think should be at uh, work here, is that the domain ontology should be in, it, controlled by domain experts. They should have the responsibility, they should have the commitment, and they should also have the incentive to maintain those domain ontologies to the highest possible quality standards. And the top level ontology should give them maximum freedom to do that work. The this goal of the top uh, level ontology is simply to create a hub of very general terms like object or process 
from which the organization of the domain ontologies can follow. And this is the strategy, as I say, which we used in the OVO Foundry. Um, it should be therefore small and easy. So we want domain experts in uh, manufacturing design to be able to understand how the hub works when they're building the ontology for manufacturing design. And that means if it's going to be easy to use, it has to be well documented. We have to have training materials, has to have definitions which are understandable to human beings, but which also support computer reasoning, which means it should be formalized in a language like OWL. Ideally, it should be formalized also in a more expressive language like common logic. It should be easily extendable. It should have been used aggressively in order to make sure that it, it's of a high quality. And um, it should have been reused in enduring real world applications. Now the competitors to BFO in the upper ontology world fail almost always on this point. So BFO has now been used for more than 10 years in many real world applications, not in academic uh, toy applications, but in drug discovery in large pharmaceutical companies and the like. And that means it has uh, withstood a lot of empirical testing. And it also has a very large and a very loud user group. Uh, the, these are ontology experts who are very critical. And this too also has contributed to the quality control of BFO. I don't know of any counterpart user group in, in the upper level ontology community of Dolce, for instance, or Sumo. Uh, certainly they each have their groups of, of developers, but a large critical user group with 140 members uh, is something which is, a, a, is a, a exclusive to BFO, I believe. Okay, now we need to clarify what we're doing here. On the one very hand, we quick have question. data model. Yes, quick, please. So uh, through that use and reuse, so BFO has also uh, evolved uh, somewhat, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so BFO has had has gone through three versions: version one, version one point one, and we're now at version two. And the change, it, BFO is very small, and so the changes have also been very small. But the mm -hmm. changes are designed to be maximally. Um, well-motivated and maximally uh, tiny in order that we will maintain the user community. Because if you have a large body of users and then you make a radical change in the ontology, then many of the users will feel left behind. And the idea is to promote stability, uh, to promote the confidence that users have that this ontology will still be alive still be maintained, still be available for use in 10 or 20 years' time. Hey, this is Steve. I have another sort of related question, which I put on the chat, by the way, which was when you talk about hub and spoke, that looks to me like a tree, and it sort of implies sort of disjoint branches of the tree. And I'm wondering, surely you would want uh, more of a graph structure where there is a uh, reuse of modules that uh, are, you know, appear in different uh, areas, wouldn't you? Yeah, so I haven't talked about this in the slides prepared for today, but we make a distinction between reference ontologies and application ontologies. I'm talking today about reference ontologies, and these are designed to be small, stable resources of, of important terms with definitions, which can be, then be reused in larger ontologies created for specific groups or for specific products or for specific, specific companies or for specific projects where you need to take advantage of these terms defined in the reference ontologies, but you need to take advantage across a number of different domains. Okay, so we divide the labor of, of maintaining generic definitions and then using them in applications. Yeah. It, I, now, does I, that make you ha happy? It makes me happier, yes. I think um, there's probably going to be some reuse even in your reference ontologies for, I don't know, various primitives or things like that. But Yeah, so 
there is actually a huge amount of reuse in the oboe foundry because the definitions of terms in one reference ontology very often use terms which are defined in other reference ontologies. And so the ontologies become networked together in a very complex graph structure, primarily through the use of terms in multiple other ontologies in definitions. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's what I was thinking would be a graph then. Okay. Good. Um, so it's a, it's a tree when you look at it from the uh, God's eye view, but it's a graph when you're actually doing the work. Okay. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Barry, just one question, um, just for the uh, reference. When uh, going back to the graph that um, Steve mentioned, so do you call each node in that graph as a reference ontology, or the whole thing as uh, a in reference the, ontology? So let me go back to that um, particular what is, what is image. The unit? Each node here is an ontology. Uh, there will be... It, 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 so in the more complicated graph, which includes both the reference ontologies and the application ontologies, it will it will be a a, a lot messier. There will be a lot a lot more edges connecting application ontologies within different boxes on the screen here. Here we're just viewing the reference ontologies. So the reference oh. ontologies are organized in such a way that there is no redundancy between the nodes. There are no, there's no overlap, which I think so, is what Steve was getting at. So each of these uh, That's color the goal, nodes, anyway. Each of these color nodes, I say, blue, green, is each of Oh, I, 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 I took this from, I, I took this from a, uh, a, a website which had nothing to do with ontologies. This is just oh. an example of the kind of structure we're going for, I think. Okay. So the hub is, is purple here, and then everything else is either a, a first level domain ontology descending immediately from the hub or a second level uh, domain ontology descending from first level domain ontology. Okay. I would say I certainly support the desire that you know you want to have one place to go if you want a weather ontology or you want a geography ontology. Exactly. And exactly. that geography ontology may in fact use you know coordinates defined in a coordinate system ontology. So there might be cross reference. Exactly. Thing, but there's exactly yeah. one go-to place for each sort of purpose you are looking for. So we are in violent agreement, Steve. Uh, okay. okay. Sounds good. And each of this node is um, what we call a reference ontology, correct? That's what I'm talking about today. So the okay. when we get down into the weeds, actually having companies or or um, organizations or universities use the IOF, then they will be dealing with application ontologies, which will involve parts of the reference ontologies uh, for their so, selected purposes, and which will extend beyond reference ontologies. So you may have an ontology for uh, NIST organizational structure, and then you will add terms which are specific to NIST, which will have nothing to do with the reference ontologies which are created for global reuse. Mm -hmm. And you, you were also okay. saying, even at the reference ontology level, um, it could be a cross-reference across the uh, reference there ontology? There will be cross-references. There will be cross-references in the simplest case through the fact that each term in each reference ontology has a definition, and the words used in that definition will very often be terms taken over from other reference ontologies. Okay. So an example would be uh, 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 elevated blood glucose level. We'll take elevated from the quality ontology, blood from the anatomy ontology, and glucose from the chemistry ontology. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so um, now we're back here. And I just want to say that, that, that a lot of ontology in the engineering world is very closely tied to data models. And, and from the medical side, we have learned very early on that there are two quite different kinds of artifacts that should be kept separate. On the one hand are data models, which represent the data you have about a specific phenomenon. And then on the other hand, there are ontologies, and the ontologies which describe the phenomenon 
not the data. And our strategy says that we're more likely to build ontologies which support interoperability, which is what we're trying to do, if we focus on a true ontology, which is about things in the world, rather than on a data model, which is about the data you have in your own particular shop. If you focus on the data, you're focused on something which is local to you. If you focus on the world, you're focusing on something which everyone shares, and so you're more likely to create a resource which promotes interoperability. And then I will just say that for this to work, then you need an ontology also which covers data. And we have an ontology which is the IAO. And actually the IAO is also a very heavily reused ontology. And I believe that the IAO is going to be very important for many of the purposes of the IOA. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a, a, a very, very generic high-level domain ontology for information artifacts like requirement specifications, maintenance reports, design drawings, and so on. And I want you to understand this distinction because it's very important to understand onto step, I believe. Um, now, I said that, well, I, I'm repeating myself now. If you base an ontology on a data model, it makes it hard to extend it to domain ontologies used by people who have other kinds of data. All right, so hey, I'm not going to talk about, yes. Hey, Barry, just real quick on that uh, uh, difference between the two. Uh, doesn't the ontology, though, then still need to make reference to uh, a number of upper ontologies, if you will, that do take uh, the data schema into account? So, so at some point, at some point we, you need to know. Where, yeah. We, yeah, where we have common data schemas which are used across the entire community, then the ontology can reasonably uh, be built around those data schemas. The problem is that it's very rare that you have data schemas that extend beyond one organization. People are working really hard to extend data schemas so that they have a more global reach. But hmm. th th it, it seems to be a very difficult uh, uh, thing to do. So I know about this primarily from medicine. Um, the, one of the reasons why the electronic health records that hospitals use don't work when people move from one hospital to another is because they were built around data. Uh, they were not build ar built around diseases or patients or uh, the like. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm assuming, and everything which I've seen so far tells me that similar problems arise in industry as well as in medicine. Oh, may okay, I ask another so, question, please? Um, absolutely. So let's say if you have a bunch of existing data models in your organization, what would be the best way to you know, make this more, better connect with the, let's say, upper level ontologies? So the, the strategy that I recommend, which again is the strategy which was used in medicine or in biology initially, is that you take the data and then you curate the data using the ontology. So the success of the OBO foundry in biology grew out of the Human Genome Project. And I'll be talking a little bit, bit about that in a minute. Um, I, I'll describe how it works there and then you can see how it would work here. But basically the idea is that the, the ontology works by being a common set of terms which can be used to tag multiple heterogeneous data sets coming both from within a single enterprise and also from multiple enterprises. And thereby the data sets become integrated through the ontology. And if you do it right, you can integrate them not merely by curating single entries in the data, uh, in the databases that you're curating, but by actually creating, a, a cu curating assertions made out of the entries in the database. And then you can start reasoning with the resulting assertion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good, so ISO 15926 is an ontology built to support uh, the oil and gas industry, or part of ISO 15926, the ontology part. And some people are promoting ISO 15926 as an upper level ontology which can be used globally for any kind of purpose. And I think that ISO 15926 is an example of everything that is bad 
in ontology. So first of all, it's not very easy to understand. Um, the, the, so I don't find this very easy to understand. And uh, when, when you look at the definition provided by ISO 15926, the definition makes things worse. So a class is a thing that is an understanding of the nature of things and that divides things into those which are members of the class and those which are not according to one or more criteria. You can just about understand what that means. It's not very good English. But then they tell us that an example of a class would be a centrifugal pump. Now, a centrifugal pump is not a class. There is a confusion here between words and the things they represent. And th this is characteristic of very many early approaches to uh, designing ontologies. And it's an, a characteristic which goes hand in hand with the use of express as a tool for designing an ontology. And the problem with step, uh, sorry, the problem with the onto step is that it grew out of step and step was formulated using express. Um, so let me just give you a, a quick overview of, of my view of onto step. So on the positive side, it covers needed geometry information and BFO does not have any geometry information really. It has a very, very small ontology of spatial regions. Uh, and none of the ontologies which have been built on the basis of BFO cover geometry. They certainly don't cover the geometry which would be needed for CAD. And so I think we have an opportunity here to use the geometry parts of OntoStep to create an extension within the um, IO foundry, which would, it, it would be, I think, rather easy to create it in such a way that it would descend downwards from BFO, the, the geometry part of, of step, of OntoStep. The next uh, virtue of onto step is that it's based on step, which is a recognized standard, which is indeed used in some places. Another advantage is that it uses OWL, which is, uh, has all the advantages that we are uh, fond of. But then the problems are, um, I didn't finish this sentence, uh, but it, it's, it's the representation of onto step is not created natively in OWL. It's created by taking big chunks of express and then tweaking them so that they can be expressed in an owl format. And the result, it has the same kinds of difficulties of understanding in my view, as we find in ISO 15926. So it's still close, still too close to being a data model approach rather than a true ontology approach. Another issue with OntoStep is that it, it, it was built without thinking about the problem which arises when you're trying to design an entire suite of ontologies. So if you're designing an entire suite, then every term in your domain ontology, and in this case, the, the onto step module of the IOF would be a geometry domain ontology, should be clear in its meaning, clear that it is relating to this domain of geometry for CAD. But if you look at um, onto step, you find terms like coordinate. Now coordinate is defined as being a length measure. And it does not seem to me that that is a reusable understanding of coordinate. You should not use a word like coordinate, which is an established broader meaning with a very specific narrower meaning if you are designing uh, ontology content, which is designed to work well with an entire suite of domain ontology modules. Otherwise you will get clashes because some of those other modules may use the word co coordinate in another sense. Now, the final uh, con uh, contrary indication for onto step is that as far as I can see, it has not been used very much. And I think this is a bit one of the reasons why its documentation is quite difficult to understand because it's not being reviewed in an aggressive way. There haven't been attempts made to disseminate onto step in a larger community. So um, another example of the prob problems I see with onto step, it, we've learned that 
it, product related product category is not a good ki type of ontology term because product related can mean anything. So if I say uh, human related or if I say um, NIST related, I'm not telling you anything about the term that is being defined. NIST related might mean near to Gaithersburg or it might mean uh, friendly with uh, Ram Sri Ram. It can mean anything. And so if you say product related product category, you're not creating a term which serves ontological purposes. It, 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 it's breaking a rule and we have rules now for how to formulate definitions. And those rules have been tested and tested and they work well. And this does not satisfy those rules. Can, okay. can you summarize rules, that rule? Yeah. So the rules you can find summarized here. Uh, there is a whole chapter on rules for formulating definitions. And I can do another talk on those rules if you like, but I didn't prepare them for today. I'm sorry. No, it was just that one rule that I was interested in. Uh, so the one rule would, I, I, so another context where you can see the rule described in great detail is in a paper on the ISO 15926, which is called Against Idiosyncrasy in Ontology Development. There is a whole chapter of that paper which is about that particular kind of problem. The rule is that you should not use terms like has or related to, which have no criteria for determining whether something is indeed related to, because related to is too vague in meaning. There's no way in which you can check whether given an A, B is related to A or not. So it could be, for instance, that A is related to B because somebody wrote a book about B in which they mention A, but nobody has read that book. It's just completely open. Thanks. Okay. okay, so uh, this is the documentation of BFO. It's also a guide to building ontologies. And uh, it, it's written for a general audience. It contains the, the details about how the Ogo Foundry was created. It contains uh, a discussion of applications of the method and of why it's useful. And it contains a brief summary then of the, of the underlying uh, technology of OWL and RDF. But it's basically a how-to uh, guide to building ontologies. Now, it grew, as I said, out of the Human Genome Project. And uh, prehistory, too, there was a slide which I uh, hid to save time, which I'm now wasting again, which is prehistory one, which is about DAML, DARPA, OWL, uh, and the semantic web. This, this tradition of ontology development, it was parallel to the semantic web tradition, and they gradually merged with each other in about 2008. And what happened was that biologists suddenly were confronted with genomic data, which is chemistry data. And they needed to associate the genomic data with terms about traditional biology, about cells, about diseases, about uh, molecular functions, about cell lines and so forth. And the gene ontology is an ontology of traditional biology which was used to curate genomic data in the way I described. And so the genome for the fly and the genome for the mouse and the genome for human were all annotated using the gene ontology, using exactly the same terms so that you get comparability based on traditional biology terms of the chemistry within the genomes of different species. And this proved to be incredibly successful, incredibly useful for doing biology by experimenting on a mouse, but then drawing conclusions based on genomic comparability for human diseases or for human drugs or for human treatments or uh, for the processes which lead to diseases in humans uh, on a computational basis. And this led to the development of more ontologies which were created by descent from the Go. So each of them was designed to be interoperable with the Go. And then BFO was created against this background. It's very closely related in structure to the structure of the Go, 
And it then served as the hub for what was called the Hobo, the Hobo Foundry, which in its original iteration looked like this. So these are all biology ontologies. The yellow ones are the gene ontology and the architecture of BFO is what organizes this chart along the vertical axis, along the, uh, sorry, along the horizontal axis. Along the vertical axis, we have organization based on granularity. So very small, medium size and large. And then we extended that to include environments. Uh, and the environment ontology is now the core of the suite of ontologies being developed by the United Nations for sustainable development, uh, which is also uh, a, a set of ontologies based on EFO. And we introduced an ontology for describing experiments. Experiments are processes, which means they're occurrence in the BFO language. And we included then an ontology for describing information artifacts associated with experiments, but also information artifacts of other kinds. So documents, um, databases, ontologies, algorithms, these are all within the, the domain of the information artifact ontology. And all of these things conform to the upper level structure determined by BFO. And then the approach was extended, uh, so it was extended to plants, it was extended to literature, in biology literature basically, but also literature associated with patents, with CVs and so forth, infectious diseases, transportation. Uh, I mentioned the United Nations, the G US Geological Survey uses BFO. And we have a, quite a number of military related uh, initiatives now using BFO. And the idea is that the IOF should be added to this list. It should be a suite of ontologies built using the principles uh, which have been tested over the years within the OBO foundry. And um, it, one advantage of doing it this way is that the work presented here and here and the lessons learned here and here can be uh, taken over very easily by the work we do. So these are some of the ontologies using BFO, some of them within the OBO foundry, some of them within other suites, but some of them ontologies which are not part of any kind of suite. And then these are ontologies which I believe might be of relevance to the um, IOF, which are, they already exist, they're based on BFO, and we can explore some of them immediately. So for instance, the milk ontology or the petrochemical ontology. Hey, Perry, I have a question. On. Yeah. Um, so I guess, if, I mean, the examples, I'm curious about if there's a specific example that you could share where like people, like industry from two different domains or groups from two different domains uh, were able to share data by linking their ontologies to the BFO ontology. So I guess there's, I, I see a lot of examples of, you know, they're able to, classify their you know, data models or whatever Good. they're within data Good. using the BFO, but the actual uh, example of sharing their data. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay. So if we go back here, so we have the cell ontology and we have the Go cellular component ontology. Mm -hmm. Now, you, that, typically when you discover a new gene, or a new gene product, a protein, for instance, you have three questions that you want to have answered. The first question is, where in the cell do I find it? Uh, and is it in the mitochondria? Is it in the nucleus? Is it in the cell go, membrane? Go is the gene ontology, right? Uh, so go is the gene ontology. Yeah. And, or, and then the second question you ask is, what kind of molecular function is it involved in? What does this protein do on the protein, on the molecular level? And then the third question you ask is, what kinds of biological processes happen downstream from the functioning of that molecular function? And so the Go has terms for these three kinds of information that you always want to know about a new gene or a new protein. Now, that, that, that proved to be very useful, as I say, that, that, that became the new biology, those three things. But then very quickly, people discovered that they needed not just to know 
where in the cell, they also needed to know what kind of cell. And so the cell ontology was created. And the cell ontology is an ontology of cell types, not cell parts. And so data, all of the data collected about genes or proteins in cellular components could suddenly be exploited also by picking out the references to cell types, blood, blood cells, for instance, or immune cells. And so the cell ontology very rapidly grew. And now there is data being exchanged between immunologists who are interested in immune cells and cell biologists who are interested in membrane cells. And they're able to exchange their data very effectively because they're both using ontologies which are built to work in tandem with each other. Now, mm -hmm. each, everywhere in this picture, you have similar possibilities for exchange of data, which you didn't have before. And when you introduce this thing, then the exchanges of data which take place here become documentable as specific protocols for data exchange, which are themselves expressed using ontology terms. On the one hand, terms taken over from these domain ontologies. On the other hand, terms about specific steps in experimental processes, including experimental processes which take place inside computers when you're doing mm -hmm. virtual experiments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it uh, truly has, it, it's been so successful that it's generated the need for more ontologies to be built. And th there are hundreds of millions of dollars which have already been invested in this. Mm -hmm. So it really is uh, proving its value. I mean, is, is there uh, like papers that's written on this kind of... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it'd be great to... So I can... Have, yeah. I will send you a, a couple of links. So, um, okay. and then you can uh, distribute them to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Thank good. You. So, hey, hey uh, Barry, just uh, along that same line of questioning, um, so what you're saying is on that, on that chart of, uh, that you just had, uh, the slide, with the, yeah, so you're saying the, uh, whether it's the continuant or an occurrence ontology, these are all reference ontologies based on your previous slide. Uh, and to map those to a data model is then done in an application ontology or is done separately by so, vendor? Or so, that the mapping, so typically you would use an application ontology when you're trying to tag your data with ontology terms because your data will typically cross over boundaries between multiple different reference ontologies. So the reference ontologies are there to make sure that the application ontologies are built in a way which rests upon well-crafted definitions and on well-tested ontology content. So the, the big problem in industry, and it's a problem everywhere, uh, to equal degrees. It's been solved to some degree in biology and medicine, but even there, it's still a problem. The main problem is this. You are told by your boss, oh, my boss says we need to have an ontology. And so you, you go away. You don't know what an ontology is. You Google the word ontology and you say, oh, I know what to do. I take protege. I take the data, the, the data schema that I use. I make protege uh, terms for all the terms I find in the data schema and then I have an ontology and it's owl and I can go and, and my boss will be happy and and then maybe you even use it for a few weeks but then it disappears and then you have a hundred other ontologies which maybe were for the same purpose which also disappear and then people say ontology it doesn't work it, it the ontologies are the things that you build and then no one uses them and they disappear after a few weeks and that's true of most ontology. But in biology, we have managed to turn this into a standard operating procedure for building ontologies which survive. And we have whole uh, sets of rules just for formatting permanent URLs which survive and which do their, do their job in such a way that even when the science changes, the original permanent URLs can still serve a useful value. And that means that all the tagging work which was done four years ago, is still valuable and still accessible, even though we have new science, which means that some parts of it have to be modified. So we've, we've really worked very hard to work out how to make high quality 
reusable ontology content. Now, that reusable ontology content is drawn on to build application ontologies in biology for your particular clinical trial or for your particular kind of research in aging phenomena in yeast. And then you draw on several ontologies to create an application ontology because you're using the same reference ontologies that everyone else in biology uses, your application ontology can contribute to um, making your data accessible to everyone else because you are tagging your data using reference ontology terms. Did that make sense? Yeah, I we still would like to see how they uh, applied these ontologies then to computationally do useful things in either search or in an application, right? Okay, so I'll give you yeah. one, one very simple example. So the gene ontology has been used to curate huge amounts of experimental data about the role of genes in different kinds of biological phenomena, including, for instance, cancer formation. Now, because this curation work has been so extensive, because the data which has been curated using the same set of terms to describe the same biological processes, that, that means that the gene ontology has created, without even intending to do it, because this was not the primary focus of the gene ontology when it was built, it's created a gigantic statistical database. Now, that database is now used as a standard for determining benchmarks for gene expression, for instance, in cancer cells. And so if you take a cancer cell and you analyze its DNA, you can compare it to the benchmark for a cell of this kind in the gene ontology annotation database, and you can see exactly which genes and which proteins in that cancer cell are overexpressed or underexpressed because they fall above or below this benchmark. And then you can take those overexpressed genes to your drug discovery lab, and you can say, in cancer cells of this kind, in this kind of patient, in this kind of organ, at this kind of stage in the cancer development, these proteins are overexpressed. See what you can do to find drugs which will target these proteins. Now, that's done computationally to create the uh, statistical benchmarks. There are computational processes based on gene ontology uh, at all the other stages in the um, drug discovery. Um, so this, this is perfectly routine. And it's, it's so routine that the people using these statistical benchmarks very often have never heard of the gene ontology. They just use the statistical benchmark. Hmm. Okay. Good. So now we are here. And we, we are already, uh, some of us anyway, uh, are building some small test case ontologies for the iOS so that we can share them amongst ourselves. We can identify the problems which arise. So Ian Gross, for instance, is, uh, and, and Fahad Amari, are, they already have ontologies which they are now trying to repurpose for the iOS by exploring how much work is involved in making them descend from BFO. And, um, uh, and then we are doing something similar in Buffalo with the functionally graded materials ontology. And Demetrius, with some help from me, is doing the same work in Lausanne with the product lifecycle ontology, which I talked about at an earlier meeting in this series. And we have information and papers on all of these if people are interested in seeing uh, what we're doing. All right, and I make a tentative announcement now because this workshop has not actually been approved yet, but we have strong reason to believe that there will be a workshop on this at the next meeting of um, uh, IDETC slash CIE uh, in Cleveland later in the year. And if anyone is interested in being involved in setting up this workshop, then they can contact me. Some of the people on the call already are involved. All right, so um, we have um, governance processes, maintenance processes for BFO, which I can go into in detail if people are interested. Um, we have uh, a, the continuant hierarchy of BFO, which divides 
the world into things made of molecules, roughly speaking, that they are material entities, and things not made of molecules, such as sites, holes in the ground, boundaries, for instance, the boundary between um, Baltimore, uh, between uh, Maryland and Virginia, uh, and spatial regions, such as the spatial region occupied by the planet Earth. Um, and then we have objects, which are independent continuous material entities, which have continuous external boundaries. And object aggregates are collections of ob objects, Fiat object parts are material entities which are parts of objects but which do not have continuous external boundaries, such as, for instance, uh, the left-hand portion of a, um, uh, of a ruler, the first six inches of a 12-inch long ruler. And I won't go into any more details, but each one of these is designed to be completely generic. This is for independent, this is for information artifacts and gene sequences, which means those attributes of things which are not tied to being, uh, not tied to one single barrier. So we can copy a document from one server to another. The server is an independent continuum. The document is a generically dependent continuum. And then we have specifically dependent continuums, such as qualities of mass or height, which are not copyable. You cannot have my maths. I can have your PDF file, but you cannot have my maths. You can have a very similar maths. And then we have functions and roles. And processes is much easier. So we have processes, process boundaries, spatial temporal regions, temporal regions. And um, I, I described uh, the, the, the implementation. So we have an OWL implementation. We have an OBO implementation, which is not relevant for our purposes. We have a common logic implementation, and you can find all the information about these at the GitHub site. Um, well, I've said a lot about what makes BFO unique, so I don't need to go over that. It's domain neutral. Um, it, it's used by downward populations. So you, you take Protégé, you import BFO, and then you, you go to the lowest BFO term which ser serves your domain purposes. So cells are objects. And so you import this part of BFO and then you're off to the races. And, um, and that, that's the end, really. I do have some more slides on Dolce, but we can leave those for another occasion. So I think we have three minutes. Thank yeah. you, Thank Barry. Yeah, that we have three minutes. But before I ask for further questions, just I would like to, let's say, you are aware, but you know that April 10 and 11, there will be uh, the annual event on smart manufacturing, if I can call it like this, at NIST. And there, one of the five sessions will be on uh, IOF. And with together with Paul Witherell, we are preparing a, a program, so an agenda that you will send out soon. And there we will Great. present uh, some cases. So uh, we will have some plenary sessions and some uh, uh, sessions where we'll present um, about six to eight cases. So, and in one of them, That's so very I, good I, I, I hope that together with um, some colleagues from another European project, so we work together on a methodology on product service systems, and we will actually working to revisit them uh, both under BFO, and uh, we hope to present some results uh, there. So on, on that work from our Good. side. You and I need to talk about some of that. Well, there have been developments in Buffalo since we last spoke, but uh, you will be pleased. Okay. And I guess we should mention that there will be a, a public meeting of the IOF once again at NIST, and that's on April the 7th and the 8th, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so the one that um, Dimitri was just referring to. Okay, good. So, uh, is there any any other question, any comment? So, um, are we going to have another session uh, that Barry is going to present more, or? So, I would suggest, uh, Sam, that we hear the Ontostep talk, okay. and then if I have more sensible things to say about Ontostep, I can do that and then add a, a few remarks about Dolce and Sumo 
um, in addition. Very. Those dates at NIST are the, the 10th and 11th in coordination with the okay, good. Yeah. OAGI workshop. Good. 